Over the last few weeks, institutions across the country have begun to look at how they have been complicit in and participants in acts of injustice in the past and also the present. The trade in enslaved Africans was not something perpetuated just by traders themselves, but also by institutions and organisations which condoned and supported the trade. It was culturally accepted in 18th century Liverpool that slavery was commercially profitable and that the men, women and children who were enslaved were an economic asset. Look, for instance, at this advertisement from the Williamson Advertiser in 1766, giving notice of the sale of 11 individuals at the Exchange Coffee House on Water Street, just around the corner from the church. The parish of Liverpool itself was no exception to the institutional collusion in this trade and we need to engage with this challenging part of our history. To find out more about the echoes of slavery in our archives in the parish, I'm going to speak to Lawrence Westgaff, an historian of the slave trade in the city. Lawrence, you've been researching the history of slavery at, in uh, Liverpool for many years and lead tours throughout the city. There's not much about slavery in Liverpool which you don't know. Um, can you tell me something about how the church was bound up in the trade in enslaved Africans? Oh yes, well, some of the towns, as it was, main citizens were uh, deeply involved in slavery. So this obviously led to um, many of the churches in the, in the town being the, these were the parishioners of those churches. So that you find them in the burial records as obviously as uh, individuals who buried there with their families, etc. But they also had uh, a number of their enslaved, um, what would you call them? Uh, enslaved property uh, interred in the graveyards themselves. And, and they got involved institutionally as well, didn't, you? didn't they? So I mean, the council, the corporation of the time um, used the clergy. Uh, well, every, I mean, every, uh, every philanthropic institution as well as the uh, corporation were very much, uh, these were the most prominent citizens, so many of them were involved in slavery directly. The corporation went as far as actually um, during the slave trade debates of the late 1780s, um, actually employed uh, a reverend to write a scriptural licitness of the slave trade, which was a justification of, um, the sla of slavery in order to make the, you know, the, 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 the well-to-do the, uh, well members of Liverpool society feel like their conscience, they had nothing to worry about because what they were doing was in line with what God wanted them to do. Um, and then along comes William Roscoe, uh, the great uh, son of Liverpool, Unitarian, and he writes a scriptural refutation to rebut um, Harris's work. I uh, don't think he would have received a hundred pounds off the corporation the way that Raymond Harris did for his work, but it was it was well received. So this trade in enslaved Africans was just bound up with all every institution in the city, wasn't it? it was every institution, um, schools, uh, medical institutions, the dispensary, uh, basically uh, all the great and the good uh, of Liverpool um, who were donating money to these institutions. Uh, so many of them were connected with wealth accrued through slavery. All the, the top and most notable families, the Earls, the Blundells, uh, the Tarletons, these are all major Liverpool slave traders and also the, uh, the major benefactors of most of the early philanthropic uh, institutions. Uh, and we can see here on the screen a uh, uh, map of the burials in the churchyard at St Nick's and we can see here the name of Thomas Gorstidge, uh, which, which stood out as you looked at it. So yeah. at him. Well, I'd come across Thomas Gorstidge in a Liverpool newspaper and he was a woolen merchant with, uh, with premises in Castle Street and he advertised, he decided to get out of the woolen business and he advertised for sale all his remaining goods, including uh, a, par a parcel of fustic dye and along with that he sold his Negro man. So all of these items were sold at the time that he decided to get out of the business. And remarkably, there it is in the Liverpool newspaper, an advertisement for an enslaved African being sold um, on the streets of the city. And, and then just uh, two graves up on this map, we see a Rathbone as well. So um, the Rathbones obviously eventually uh, took the other point of view and campaigned for abolition. Yes, certainly did. Um, William Rathbone IV was the real abolitionist in the family. And he, uh, he kind of passed that down to his son. Ironically enough, though, they were all involved in the importation of slave-produced cotton. So although they, were, they, were, they opposed the slave trade, 
by buying cotton that was produced in America. They were actually supporting it. This is one of the great contradictions of many of the abolitionists in Liverpool. On one hand, they abhorred the trade, but on the other hand, it was responsible for their uh, great wealth. Again, this is, this is very common in Liverpool. And I think in, in a moment we'll talk about some of the complexity of, of the issue and of history as well. But when we turn to our parish registers, and of course the parish of Liverpool contained over 30 churches by the 19th century. So all the registers of the different churches relate to us as the parish of Liverpool. But uh, uh, I, I know that you've found uh, quite a number of references and some rather interesting ones in the registers. Absolutely. I mean, well, in, in re relation to St. Nicholas's, we've got the first confirmed burial of a person of African descent in the churchyard in Liverpool. So this was in 1717, on the 1st of October, 1717, Abel, a blackamoor belonging to Mr. Rock, was buried in the churchyard. Mr. Rock was probably Samuel Rock, who's an early Liverpool slave trader. Now, when you think that at the time of this burial, Liverpool's population was only about 10,000 people. This is a time when, you know, Liverpool's a tiny little place still, obviously growing and it grows exponentially throughout the 18th century. It goes from about a population of 5,000 to 80,000 by the end of the century, which makes it the second largest conurbation in the country, which is something that people really forget. Um, but for me, the, the, the importance of that is that black people have been a part of Liverpool Parish literally since the early years of it being a separate parish. You know, if you think that we only became a parish in 1699, and there's even some evidence earlier on in St. Nicholas's Church, which is tentative evidence, but may indicate that there was a, a black people living in the parish as early as 1674, when Catherine, the wife of black John Williamson, is actually buried in the churchyard. Now, I've never, ever seen a nickname attributed to anybody in the parish record. So I'm thinking that black John may well have been a black man, but I haven't got any evidence to confirm that. Yeah, one way fascinating, either. isn't it? The, um... Absolutely. Um, but I notice in the baptism registers in the 18th century that they also continue to, to refer to people's um, uh, heritage uh, in a way that they don't later on. By the 19th century, they don't seem to. Well, well, this is interesting because that is only usually when people are not born in the parish. So I've, I associate that, I've written about this quite extensively in my PhD, I associate that more with people coming from elsewhere rather than people who are being buried here. So I've been able to, I mean, sorry, people who've been born here. So I've been able to identify lots of people who are of colour, who aren't referred to as being of colour in parish records, and that's because they were born in Liverpool and hadn't come from elsewhere. So the settlement laws, the settlement, you know, the um, settlement laws of, of the uh, early poor laws, that would uh, lead people to need certificates of settlement. So what that led to was the need to be able to identify people. And obviously an identifying feature would be skin color, especially where you've had got anglicized names. So yes. Because almost everybody in the parish records was black. Well, I think Williams was probably the, com the most common name in the, in the parish records that I've come across. But all, the vast majority of all got anglicized names. It would have been a significant way of identifying somebody if they needed to claim on the poor laws. So the first time, it's very difficult to find black children being born in Liverpool because they would have been baptised at birth and there would have been no reason to mention their colour simply because they had settlement as a right of birth. So the earliest pa um, baptism of, of, of a black, or the earliest um, birth of a black child in Liverpool that we can identify happened in St. Peter's Church, the other parish church, in yeah. 1752, when um, Peter Smith, the son of Mary Smith, and Mr. Reed's Negro Mercury was actually was actually baptized. Now this makes me think that he was probably illegitimate, and Mary Smith had obviously been having a relationship with this enslaved man called Mercury. But their child, they, she obviously had a child, and uh, he was baptized in St. Peter's. So I say that's the first identifiable be, uh, be, um, baptism of a black scouser, somebody who's literally <laughs> born in the parish uh, and in 1752. And of course, the other thing is that the the surnames are not identifiable because very often the um the person who owned the slave gave his surname absolutely absolutely it's very very difficult to identify black people just using parish records they're the best source for identifying black people but they're also very risky or fragmentary because if you just look at them and you didn't take into account what i'm what i was saying about birth then you would literally think that black people were never born in Liverpool at any period, apart from this one child in 1752, who the registrar obviously thought was important to mention, uh, that his, his father was the slave of a man called Mr. Reed. These are some of the interesting um, 
entries that you find because register registers and registrars in that time were allowed to put in whatever they thought was important to note which that that leads to some of the issues that you're talking about later on so we're after 1812 after the passing of the george rose act these um these descriptions diminish very rapidly in Liverpool because that act stipulated what should be entered and what shouldn't be entered. And there were consequences to the registrar if they didn't put the entry in the way that government had suggested that they had. And we so still this, live with that today as we fill in the registers. Exactly. So, so there's these fascinating issues behind the registers that just make them the most intriguing documents to look at. And as we move forward, I, I'm now feel that that because we're so bound up institutionally that we uh, as a church in 2020 and uh, cannot ignore black lives matter and the importance of of trying to get justice uh, and equality in uh, across the world um on these issues of the, these are very straightforward and the parish has got a very checkered history in that way so we've already seen that institutionally we were entirely bound up in it in the 18th century by the 1940s when uh, there probably was no less racism uh, in our communities than, than in the 18th century in some ways um, we were very progressive and we had a succession of black clergy coming over from Africa um, uh, connected to the, the then rector Ambrose Reeves who later went and became a bishop in Johannesburg um, and at that point we, we were progressive and we've also of course surrounded ourselves with the history we're, we're bound up with the history of the Gladstones and uh, and we know that that's been part of the debate. Uh, what's your own feeling about the pulling down of statues? Well, personally, I'm not a fan of it at all. You know, I believe in retaining them and reinterpreting them. I think they're an, a fantastic educational tool. I think the public realm is actually the best classroom in which to enge engage with people, simply because uh, the demographic that you, you, you reach all demographics in the public realm, um, which you don't necessarily do in a classroom. Also, as a tour guide, as someone who does tours on this subject, I find it far easier to engage with a younger audience when I take them out on a tour than if I just give them a boring, dry lecture. And maybe if they're lucky, they'll get a PowerPoint in a room for an hour. If I take them out on a tour, when I take them to the site, these sites of memory and to see these memorials and monuments, they're transfixed. You know, they ask questions, they're really engaged. They, you know, it's, it's having history in 3D. That's mm. what I think is really important instead of just having it flat, you know, and I think a lot of people, because of the way the curriculum works, local people don't find out about their local area. Now, if you come from a city like Liverpool, which as we've just discussed, was a tiny little place just 300 years ago, and you realise and you think about what we've actually packed into 300 years of history, it's pretty much unprecedented. We are the quintessential boom town something that is you know doesn't exist one minute and then is like is on the world stage the next minute and that makes it very in a very interesting place to uh, to look at history also the fact that our ties with the world are so extensive mm. it gives you this um, a great ability to be able to use the local to tell the global which i think is a real um a real asset when discussing history here in Liverpool. But you're also trying to uh, tell that, that history in, in a new way to encapsulate some of what we've just discussed. So, so you're leading a, a fundraising campaign at the moment. Yes, it kind of came out of seeing the Colston statue fall and a, a real feeling of desperation. Um, because as I say, I'm not really a fan of, you know, tearing things down. I like to build things up. So when I, when I heard of this, um, of the tearing down of the statue, I said, well, surely the reaction to that should be to build a monument. So we know about all these um, enslaved people who were buried in Liverpool, many of whom were buried in St. Nick's, but the majority of which were buried in the parish cemeteries, you might imagine, over at St. John's. Um, so I, I was of the opinion that we should put up a statue to these individuals who were forgotten, who probably weren't buried with a marker, many of whom were not even buried with their names. You'll find entries both in St. Nicholas's and in St. John's for black people simply referred to as um, belonging to somebody else. So, for example, at St. John's uh, on the 23rd of September, 1778, a black boy belonging to Captain Penny was actually buried there and he has no name so these names th these individuals are impossible to trace we can't find out anything about their lives apart from the fact that captain james penny owned him um but we know that he's buried at st john so the idea was to raise a memorial and to inscribe the ins uh, to, to inscribe the, the transcriptions of what is in the uh, the burial registers onto the monument so these people will be remembered and people who walk through there every day will see this memorial this monument and be able to look at it and be shocked because so few people are aware that enslaved people actually lived, uh, died and were buried here. 
they think that all the enslaved people that Liverpool uh, was involved in ended up in the Americas somewhere when there was a significant number that actually did live in the city. And how can we donate? Oh, we can, you can donate by going to the Liverpool Enslaved Fundraiser on Facebook. Um, sadly, that's the only way that I can really suggest. But you could always send any do uh, donation to Crispin and he could forward them on if he wanted to. If you're not tech savvy, I know Crispin very much is, not like me. Uh, but um, if, if you yeah, if you want to uh, pass, uh, thank pass you, anything up. Brilliant. Absolutely. Lawrence, thank you ever so much. It's been fascinating talking to you. Thank you. Thank you.